Pancake was the brand name of the makeup material that Gemini Studios bought in truckloads. Greta Gabo must have used it. Miss Gaha must have used it. Vijay and Tamala must also have used it. These are the names of actresses. But, Riti Agnihotri may not have even heard of it. Because she was a new actress, and had entered the industry much later. The makeup department of the Gemini Studios was in the upstairs of a building that was believed to have been Robert Clive's stables. Stables? Building for keeping horses. A dozen other buildings are said to have been his residence. Robert Clive was an English soldier and governor who expanded his power in India. For his brief life and an even briefer stay in Madras, he seems to have done a lot moving besides fighting some impossible battles and marrying a maiden in St. Mary's Church in Fort St. George in Madras. The makeup room looked like a hair cutting salon with lights at all angles around half a dozen mirrors. They were all very bright lights, so you can imagine the fiery misery of those who were subjected to makeup. Fiery means, like fire. The makeup department was first headed by a Bengali. After he left, he was succeeded by a Maharashtrian, who was assisted by a Dawod, an Andhra, a Madras Indian Christian, an Anglo Burmese, and the usual local Tamils. All this shows that long before Raya, Odor Odarsham began broadcasting programs, there was enough of national integration. AR, here stands for All India Radio. This gang of nationally integrated makeup men could turn any decent looking person into a dreadful monster with the help of truckloads of pancakes and some other locally made potions. Those were the days of only indoor shooting and only 5% of the film was shot outdoors. I think, the sets and studio lights needed the girls and boys to be made ugly, to look presentable in the movie. Means, they were required to get a load of makeup, even if it made them look ugly. Makeup would make the boys and girls ugly. A strict hierarchy was maintained in the makeup department. The chief makeup man, made the chief actress and actresses ugly. His senior assistant made the second hero and heroine, and the junior assistant made the main comedian ugly. And so forth. The makeup department even had an office boy. His responsibility was, the players who played the crowd. On the days, when there was a crowd shooting, you could see him mixing his paint in a giant vessel, and slapping it on the crowd players. The idea was, to close every pore on the surface of their faces in the process of applying makeup. The office boy was not a boy. He was in his early forties, having entered the studios years ago, in hope of becoming a star actor, or a top screenwriter. He was a bit of a poet. Do you know what was my work in the Gemini Studios? In those days, I worked in a cubicle. Cubicle is a small room. Two sides of which were French windows. I didn't know at that time that they were called French windows. Sitting at my desk, I would tear up newspapers, day in and day out. When people would see me collecting newspaper cuttings, they thought, I was doing nothing. I think the boss thought that way, too. Anyone who felt I should be given some occupation, would barge into my cubicle, and deliver a long lecture. The office boy felt the same. He had decided, that I should be enlightened on how great literary talent of mine was being allowed to waste in such a work which is fit only for barbers and perverts. Perverts mean workers. I was praying all the time for crowd shooting. Nothing less than this could save me from his epics. Epics are long poems. In all cases of frustration you will always find that the anger is directed towards a single person. Similarly the office boy of the makeup department was convinced that all his troubles, ignominy and neglect ignominy means shame. Would you too count to Mangalam Sabu? Sabu was the number two at Gemini Studios. He couldn't have had a more encouraging opening in films than our grown up makeup boy had. On the contrary, he had to face more difficult times 
as when he began his career, there were no firmly established film producing companies and studios. Even, he couldn't get education, as much as the office boy had got. But, by virtue of being born a Brahmin, he must have had exposure to more rich situations and people. He had the ability to look cheerful at all times, even after having a hand in a flop film. He always had work for somebody, as he could never do things his own. But his sense of loyalty to his principle, made him identify himself, with his principle completely. Principle, here, is referring to his boss the producer. He could turn his entire creativity, to his principle's advantage. He was a tailor, made for films. He was a man, who could be inspired, when commanded. Once, the producer said, The rat fights the tiger underwater, and kills her, but takes pity on her cubs, and takes care of them lovingly. I don't know how to do the scene. Sabu would come out with four ways, of the rat showing love on the cubs of the tigress. Good, but I am not sure it is effective enough. And in a minute, Sabu would come out with 14 more alternatives. Filmmaking was so easy, with a man like Sabu around. And if there was a man, who gave direction and definition to Gemini Studios during its golden years, it was Sabu. Sabu had a separate identity, as a poet. Although he could write more complex and higher forms, like novels, yet he chose to show his poetry to the public through the films. His critics felt, that his success in films, overshadowed his literary achievements. Means, his literary achievements looked small, in front of his success in films. He composed several truly original story poems in folk refrain and diction. He wrote a large novel, Hilanimo and Amble, with dozens of very carefully made characters. He recreated the mood and manner of the Devadasis of the 20th century. A Devadasi was a female artist who was dedicated to the worship and service of a deity or a temple. This was prominent in South India. He was an amazing actor too. He never wanted lead roles, but whatever supplementary role he played, he performed better than the supposed main players. He had a genuine love for anyone he came across. And his house was a permanent residence, for dozens of near and far relations. Sabu was never conscious, that he was feeding and supporting so many of them. Such a charitable and improvident man. And yet, he had enemies. Improvident means, a person who doesn't care about his money. Yes, he had enemies. Was it because he seemed so close and intimate with the boss? Intimate means, personal. Or was it his general behavior, that resembled a sycophant's? Sycophant means, flatterer. Or his readiness to say nice things about everything? In any case, there was this office boy in the makeup department. Who would wish the direst things for Sabu? Direst means terrible. Sabu was seen always with the boss. But officially, his name was grouped under a department, called the Story Department. This department consisted of poets, writers, and a lawyer. The lawyer was also known as the legal advisor. But everyone referred to him as its opposite. Once, an extremely talented actress, who was also extremely short-tempered, burst out her frustration on the sets, while everyone stood stunned. But the lawyer quietly switched on the recording equipment. When the actress paused for breath, the lawyer said to her, One minute, please. And he played back the recording. Hearing her own frustrating voice through the sound and equipment, she was struck dumb. A girl from a rural area, she hadn't gone through all the stages of the worldly experience, that is important, before such a situation. She never recovered from the terror she felt that day. That was the end of a short, but brilliant acting career. The legal advisor had, unknowingly, brought about that sad end. While every other member of the story department, wore a kind of uniform, a khadi dhoti, with a clumsily tailored white khadi shirt. Clumsily means, 
carelessly. The legal adviser wore pants, and a tie, and sometimes a coat, that looked like a coat of mail. A coat of mail, is a coat covered with metal plates, serving as armor. The legal adviser's coat looked like a coat of mail. Often he looked alone and helpless. A man of cold logic. In a crowd of dreamers. A neutral man, in an assembly of Gandhiites and Kadiites. Means all of them followed Gandhi, but the legal adviser was neutral. Like so many people, who were close to the boss, he was allowed to produce a film. Though a lot of raw stock and pancake was used in the film, not much of the film came. Then one day, the boss closed down the story department. And this was perhaps the only instance in all human history, where a lawyer lost his job, because the poets were asked to go home. Gemini Studios, was the favorite place to visit, for poets like S.D.S. Yogaya, Sang Subramanyam, Krishna Sastri, and Arindranath Chattopadhyaya. The studios had an excellent mess. That supplied good coffee all day, and for most part of the night. Those were the days, when Congress rule meant prohibition. And meeting over a cup of coffee, was rather satisfying entertainment. Everybody at the studios, except the office boys and some clerks, radiated Liza. Leisure is necessary, for poetry. Most of them wore Khedi, and worshipped Gandhi G. But beyond that, they had no appreciation for any political thoughts. They all greatly disliked the term. Communism. A communist, was a godless man, who had no filial or conjugal love. Filial love, means his love for his children. Conjugal love, means love for his wife. He was a man, who had no pity about killing his own parents or children. He was always out to cause and spread violence among innocent and ignorant people. This notion floated among the Kaili clad poets of Gemini Studios. The proof will be shown soon. In 1952, Frank Bunchman's Moral Rearmament Army, or MRA, with some 200 people, visited Madras. They couldn't have found a better host in India than Gemini Studios. MRA was a movement initiated by Frank Buckman, against international communism. They wanted to make their plays in the studios. Someone called the group, an international circus. They were not good at trapeze. And their relation with animals, was only at the dinner table. But they presented two plays, in a most professional manner. Jotham Valley, and The Forgotten Factor. These ran several shows in Madras, and along with the other citizens of the city, the Gemini family of 600, saw the plays over and over again. The message of the plays were usually plain and simple homilies. Homily means, lesson. But the sets and costumes were first rate. Madras and Tamil drama community were extremely impressed, and for some years, almost all Tamil plays had the scene of sunrise and sunset, just like it was in Jotham Valley. It was a stage, a white background curtain, and a tune played on the flute. Some years later, I learnt that the MRA was a kind of counter-movement to international communism, that is, it was against communism. And the big bosses of Madras, like Mr. Vasan, simply played into their hands. Means, Mr. Vasan, the boss of Gemini Studios, even being a communist, supported the MRA, without realizing, that it spread into communist feelings in the staff. However, the aspects of these big bosses remained the same, MRA or no MRA, communism or no communism. The staff of Gemini Studios had a nice time hosting 200 people, of all hues and sizes, of at least 20 nationalities. It was such a change, from the usual crowd players, waiting to be slapped with thick layers of makeup by the office boy, in the makeup department. A few months later, the telephone lines of the big bosses of Madras buzzed. And once again we, at Gemini Studios, cleared a whole shooting stage, to welcome another visitor. All they said, was that he was a poet from England. No one knew why the boss had called him. The only poets from England the simple Gemini staff knew, were Wordsworth and Tennyson. The more literate ones knew of Keats, 
Shelley and Byron, and one or two might have heard the name, Eliot, who was the poet visiting the Gemini Studios now. Mr. Vassan was also the editor of the popular Tamil Weekly, Anand Vikatan. So, some people thought that the person who was visiting the studios was not a poet, but an editor. That's why the boss was giving him a big reception. All we knew was that he wasn't the editor of the known names of British publications in Madras. He was supposed to be the editor of a daily, but not of the Manchester Guardian, or the London Times. Well, we had to wait. Around four in the afternoon. The poet, or the editor, arrived. He was a tall man, very English, very serious. And of course, very unknown to us. Battling with half a dozen pedestal fans on the shooting stage, the boss, Mr. Vazan read out a long speech, to tell you about the guest. Listening to his speech, it was obvious, that he too knew very little about the editor. The speech was all in the most general terms, but it was peppered with words like freedom, and democracy. Then, the poet, or say, the editor spoke. He couldn't have addressed a more dazed and silent audience. No one knew what he was talking about, and his extremely British accent made it impossible to understand his words. The whole thing lasted about one hour, and the poet left. And we all moved in confusion. What are we doing? What is an English poet doing in a film studio, which makes Tamil films for the simplest sort of people? People whose lives didn't afford the possibility of cultivating a taste for English poetry? The poet looked puzzled too, as he must have felt the incongruity of his talk about his thrills and efforts in his life. Incongruity means, inappropriateness. Means, the poet was puzzled to talk about his journey to become a poet, to such a dazed audience. His visit remained an unexplained mystery. The great prose writers of the world may not admit it, but my opinion grows stronger day by day, that prose writing is not, and cannot be the true search of a genius. Prose writing is for the patient, persistent, resolute man, with a so sunken heart, that nothing can break it, rejection slips doesn't mean a thing for him. He, at once, sets about making a fresh copy of the long prose piece, and sends it to another editor. For such people, the Hindu, had published a small announcement. In an unimportant corner of an unimportant page. That a short story contest was being organized by, a British periodical named The Encounter. Periodical means, magazine. The Encounter. Wasn't known among the Gemini literati. Before spending much money in sending a postage of my manuscript to England. I wanted to get the idea of the magazine. Those days, the British Council Library had an entrance, with no long signal boards, and notices. I didn't feel like I was sneaking into a prohibited area. And there were copies of, The Encounter, lying about, almost untouched by the readers. When I read the editor's name, I heard a bell ringing, in my shrunken heart. It was the poet who had visited the Gemini Studios. I felt like, a long lost brother and I sang, as I sealed the envelope and wrote out his address. I felt, that he too would be singing the same song, at the same time. In Indian films, you know, long lost brothers discover each other, by singing the same song, in the first reel, and the final reel of the film. Stephen Spender. Stephen, that was his name. Years later, I was out of Gemini Studios, and I had much time, but not much money. So, anything with reduced price, attracted me. On the footpath in front of the Madras Mount Road post office, there was a pile of new books, for 50 pays each. A stylish book of American origin. Special low-priced student edition, in connection with the 50th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. I paid 50 pays and picked up a copy of the book named The God That Failed. In this book, six famous men, in six separate essays, described their journeys into communism and their disillusioned return. Those are Andre Gerd, blah blah, blah blah, 
blah blah, blah blah, and Stephen Spender. What Stephen Spender? Yes. Means Stephen's first believed in communism, but then realized it was bad. Suddenly, the book assumed tremendous significance. Stephen Spender, the poet who had visited Gemini Studios. In a moment, I felt a dark chamber of my mind lit up by an unclear light. The reaction to Stephen Spender at Gemini Studios was no longer a mystery. I think, due to spread of anti-communist feelings in the staff, by the plays of MRA, Mr. Vasan was perhaps disturbed, as he was a communist. So he called Stephen, who was a communist first. He hoped that Spender would talk about communism. But Mr. Vasan didn't know that he was already against communism. So, he just spoke about his life journey to the audience and nothing about communism. Mr. Vasan may not have much to do with Spender's poetry. And definitely not with his God that failed, that is, his return to anti-communism.